Okay, I just want to give you another go through this just to build your confidence. Or let's go from A to B again and look at your dynamics or look at your articulation. Even if you just want them to play the section again, give them a reason. Give them something to focus on rather than, okay, we're going to play this again. Why? So it's sort of just a mindless repetition. So to say, okay, A to B, I want to focus on dynamic contrast or style or phrasing, but don't just, okay, let's just do that again. Let's just do that again. Let's just do that again. What, what is the purpose of that? Do you give empty praise? This is pretty common. And our students probably know when they're playing something well and when they're not. And if they're not playing something well and we give the cursory, oh, that was good, it's meaningless. In fact, it's more offensive than anything else. So I think honesty is really important. I don't think we have to be negative with them, but honest. And if something's not going very well, just that's not sounding very good. And here's, here's why. We can diagnose that. But please avoid the empty praise. And I, I can hear teachers, you know, probably myself, at times say, oh, that was good. That was good. It's just sort of what we do. We end up, okay, that was good. Well, if it really was, then that was really good. Trumpets, that's improved so much. Give something specific. Clarinets, I really like that piano. Instead of just this blanket, oh, that was good, it suddenly just means nothing. But also when something is not good, we have to have the, the courage to tell them that it's not very good. And I, I love watching the symphony band. They're great students. They play well. But I say, that just didn't sound very good. You would have thought that I, I stole their puppy. <laughs> and I'm not harsh. You know, I don't, I don't yell. I have the same kind of demeanor with them that I have with you. A little bit of energy. I'm trying to exhibit some fire here. And um, I say, that just doesn't sound very good. And I still like you. <laughs> but I have to be honest with you. And they know that. But if I, you know, I say, oh, that was great, yeah, let's move on. That doesn't work. So do you give a lot of empty praise? It's common in our profession, and we have to be careful. Praise when it's appropriate. Do you have speech mannerisms? Ums, you know, like, really, um. The common one now is right. Everyone has right. Those donuts are good, right? So that's the one today. So you can be aware of of how you speak and you have those mannerisms. There was, uh, when I was in Illinois, we had a TA, and every time he conducted the band, every single time he put his hands up to start, he'd say, ready. Every single time. Ready? Then he'd, he'd go, rehearse something. Ready? Yep. So what did the band start doing? <laughs> On their music. Ready? 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 So now all they're thinking about is how many times is he going to say ready today? So we have them. We have those mannerisms. We have to be in control of that. We don't want our students to say, well, let's see how many times she says right today. Oh, 35. Oh, this was a good day. Yeah, so be aware of, of every aspect of, of what you do. Do you know and address your students by name, as we talked about earlier? That is an absolute. If, you're, if, if that's a challenge for you, then create a seating chart with, with the students' names on it. At, at Iowa, we have the technology. I, I guess you do too. But we can go in and look at a file. It has their picture and... Of hometown and everything so you, you get to know them before you even see them in the first class. For marching bands it's it's difficult. You have 150, 200 kids, Keith Bearden did, did it with 400, bringing in 100 new students a year or whatever so you can do it. But that just instead of, hey trombone in the blue sweater, you're, you're uh, out of line, that just doesn't work. It does not express value or respect. So you've got to learn those names, address them respectfully, Sincerely, do you create a safe rehearsal environment by using supportive comments and gestures, or do you 
uh, rely on sarcasm and negative expression. Our students deserve to feel safe, and that's safe physically. We, you know, we see instant, tragic instances in the news, but also safe mentally from any kind of mental abuse. We can achieve great results from approaching what we do positively and constructively. And I, I came through the old school system of, um, you know, my teacher in Illinois was a student of Rebelli. Actually, Rebelli is in my sort of conductor family tree. But um, it was very intense, and I don't know that we played as well as we could have if the environment had been a little bit more positive. So how do you approach that? Are you sarcastic? Oh, that was great, trumpet. That doesn't build anyone up. Trumpets, that was um, it just it just doesn't and you know maybe they will think it's funny or a couple of snickers but you want to live we want to lift people up in our business we are we're in the business of creative activity and so we want to support people that's not to say again oh that was great trumpets when it wasn't we have to have standards but you can you can convey expectations in a positive way so you're building people up you also want to create an environment where I think your students are free to make musical decisions and take some chances. You don't want to be, you don't want to create an environment where they feel stifled. And I've, I've been in those environments where I knew I was not free to make my own musical decisions or to, to take some chances as a player. So what kind of environment do you create for your students? Do you enable your students to participate openly in discussion about the music or the ensemble's performance during rehearsal? How many of you engage your students that way? You ask them, what do you think about that or the music? You actually let the students talk a little bit during rehearsal. It's amazing what they can come up with and, and what they, they hear, you know, whether you're talking about the music itself or maybe a performance aspect, what, what that trombone player can hear back there that maybe we're missing. Oh, I'm, I'm not hearing that. Yeah, there's something that sounds really bad over here. And give them an opportunity to invest and be engaged in the process so it's not so much top driven. It's not, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know, just listen to me, so it's a more community activity. So I'd encourage you to find ways to create those opportunities to ask students about the music or what do you hear here? I've had students, if I, um, maybe there'd be something in a piece of music where you're approaching a fermata or just some instance, maybe there are three or four different ways to handle it. So I might go through, okay, let's experiment. Let's, let's do this this way. Let's do this this way. Let's do this a different way. What do you think? Which one did you like? Well, I kind of like the second way. What did you like about it? It's a, great. Let's do it that way and give them some ownership. Again, instead of just being, I will make all of the, the decisions. And so we can empower them a little bit. I will say that asking questions like this in the van is not time efficient. It takes time, but it's empowering and it's enriching. And it, just, it creates a different kind of climate in the rehearsal than if someone is just giving them all of the information. Similar to this, I do a lot of conductorless work. And so I, in fact, I probably, I still conduct more than I don't, but I do a lot of work where I'll start a piece and just let the band play. And I'll step off and I'll walk around, I'll get back in the trombone section, and I know they, they start getting really nervous, <laughs> but I get to hear a little bit differently, and, and it really empowers them. I, I, I strive to make myself obsolete in a way. So that's another way of empowering the students um, I was trying to think. We did Cityscape by Scott Warma on the last concert. It was really, really difficult. I launched them and then I got off the podium and just let them play. First, first time, crash and burn. It was a meltdown. Stop. They weren't listening. Do it again. Second time, they got it. They were able to go all the way through. So, do you use humor to lighten the mood? I try very hard to make my students laugh once each rehearsal. I don't have a great sense of humor. I'm a pretty serious, tightly wound individual. But I try to lighten the mood once, 
during every rehearsal. And maybe it's something self-deprecating. Often it's about me, that I'll, I'll say some joke or something humorous about me, or just share some little silly story about something that happened with our silly cat or whatever, just to get the kids to laugh. Nobody smiles anymore. They're all, you know, like the Black Knight, the movie, why so serious? You know, the Joker. I got you to laugh. Some of you. Some of you haven't laughed yet this morning, but we have a long day together. I'll get you. Um, but something, but they're, they're so serious about what they're doing, and they come in and making music is serious. And Well, it's important, but it can be fun, and you can make music with a smile on your face and be fine, all within the context of an, a professional environment. Every day, every rehearsal, try to get them to laugh about something or lighten the mood somehow. They, you know, they're just, the world is really serious right now, so I think it's important when they come into that sanctuary that they can just relax a little bit and, and not be quite so... Uh, quite so serious all the time. And I do think some, more times than not, they just laugh at me because my jokes are bad, but that's fine. As long as I can just get them to laugh, that's okay. Now, I don't turn it into a road show either. So it's not, you know, I'm not up there um, improvising for an hour and a half, but at least one moment when I think, yeah, we've been driving this pretty hard. This would be a good time just to kind of lighten the mood. I do that with honor bands. You know, it's important. Let's work hard together. Okay, now we can relax. Let's breathe for a minute. Now let's get right back to it. So, and I, I try not to get them to laugh at anyone's expense, you know, unless it's just kind of a little tease or something. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do try that. Like that is one thing I do daily to make them laugh. But I teach junior high, and those kids get out of control, like, even if it's for like ten seconds. Do y'all have any friends, family in here? Do y'all have any advice to that to try to pull that down quickly? Yeah, I do. So yes. get, them, get them to laugh. It's like, okay, stop. We have to be serious oh now. My God. <laughs> they would just look at me like I'm crazy. No, I'm kidding. That's a good question. Any thoughts? And I. I have taught junior high, so I can imagine what you're it's like, oh, now we got to rein them back in. Yeah, and I try to do it before I start. I do my announcements, try to make them laugh before the rehearsal, and then get in the series. Because I know if I do that in the middle of my series rehearsal, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. Do it in the last two minutes, like I said. <laughs> I'm going to try that. Um, I'm a middle school director, and I, when you said that, these people work for me. And they, I mean, that's me. I teach with humor almost all the time. Um, but I don't know how I get my kids back in. They just do. Yeah. I think it's like to tell a joke. Usually it's about myself. Maybe it's about something that happened. Maybe it's a story about something that happened a couple years ago. Whatever. And then it's just like, all right. Like, right, hey. I mean, it's just like, I don't get the, an opportunity to get the front on their face. Right. Just like, get the playing again. And then they play, and then you're done with that. And so then you move on. That's, I mean, for me, joke, they might still be laughing. And I'll turn the net on, and then I'm like, okay, hey. And then, and it may not be the best start, but it gets them like back right. in the play. It's worse for my seventh grade. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm really getting at. Yeah. Okay, you, I'm guessing you're Because my answer is the same way. Yeah. Well, Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's important, you know, and I'm, I'm working with a, a different age level of kids, but I think it is important to use humor and just not, you know, I can be really too serious all the time, and it's, so I would encourage you to, to think about, and you have to have your own teaching style, too, like you mentioned, you use humor a lot, it's not in me, so I have to not really manufacture it, but I have to think, okay, now's the time, I kind of need to lighten the mood, it's a strategic time. But just, just think about that, and do you use humor, or is it just all really intense? Do you focus on one section in the band for a very long period of time to the exclusion of others? We have to be careful not to turn our full rehearsals into <coughs> sectionals. I think that's easy to do. So I try to be mindful if I'm working with the clarinets for a while, and it's just not not where I want it to be. I'll just say, okay, clarinets, um, that's your homework for tonight. Just be careful to balance isolating. Hey, percussion, let's work on this. While you're working with eight percussionists back there, you have 60 kids sitting. 
And even though you may say follow your part along and finger along, they're still sitting. So be careful how you balance that. Those kids want to play. They want to play. So try to keep more of the students involved. This is a big one for me today. Do you focus more on the technical aspects of the ensemble's performance rather than on the expression? So do you, as you think about your own rehearsals, everyone, are most of your comments clinical or are they expressive musical in nature? So as you rehearse, do you spend most of your time trying to line things up, trying to get all of the technical aspects cleaned up and in place, or are the majority of your comments about phrasing, style, dynamics, maybe balance, and you want a darker color of sound here, so let's have more tuba, you 20 flutes play softer, that kind of thing. So as you think about your rehearsals, are you spent, you spend more of your time on the mechanical, the technical, let's get all the right notes and right rhythms in place. Then we'll deal with the music thing over here. Understanding that, yeah, right notes and right rhythms are essential. You gotta have it, you can't have a wrong note on a concert. But if that's all we're teaching, then we're not getting to the music. And I will tell you a story. Um, this wasn't for me directly, I did hear it from a colleague. So he was going out to clinic high school band and the band director said well we have we got all the right notes and right rhythms I want you to come in and do the music stuff the music stuff it's kind of like my story about the scale that's heartbreaking like all oh, those poor kids so they have only been working getting everything lined up okay it's all no music whatsoever right notes and right rhythms does not equal music and understand that music making, passion, if they're really making music, it's going to be a little messy. It's not all going to be neat and tidy. Now you can have a neat and tidy performance, but it'll be a so what. There's no musical message to that. And it's in this time of contest, when I was teaching in Texas, it was a pretty intense UIL competition, you had to have a nice balance of the, the two. For the judges, you weren't going to get a one if you didn't have right notes and right rhythms to play in tune. But you also had to have expression. So when you give your comments to the student, where do you live? Clinical, musical, or maybe a nice balance of the two? Do you balance your talking and the students playing, or do you find yourself talking much more than the students play? I would imagine if you recorded your rehearsals, I have my graduate students do this. They talk too much. They're trying to impress the kids on how much they know. They talk too much. Okay, I want you to go through with a stopwatch in the, if they have 30 minutes to rehearse. How much time was, did you spend talking? And how much time did they spend playing? Okay, I spent 22 minutes talking. And yeah, that doesn't work. I expect most of us fall into that. We, t we all talk too much. They want to play, so how do you balance that? I've got to give them information, I've got to give them feedback. I'd be curious if you'd be willing to do that. Record a rehearsal and just say, in my 40 minute rehearsal, how much of that am I talking, and how much of that are they playing? And if it's, if it's too much, if you're talking way too much, then get it, get it less. Be more efficient with what you're doing. Just talk less and play more. If they want to play, and I think that's directly related to retention. You know, students are students are involved in band in large part because they want to play an instrument. There's a societal factor their friends are in, and that's important. But they're in there to play and make music and have fun doing that. And if we squelch that because we talk too much or we don't have enough playing activity, then why why do it? You know, so be careful about that one. Do you tend to have your students play through entire sections or, of works without providing them any substantial feedback? So make sure that you're, you're committed to giving them comments that will address problems as well as complementing what they're doing well. Are you a different person when you're on the podium than when you're off or are you the same? 
Some people intentionally are two different people, sort of a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I think the kids want us to be the same. At least that's my thinking. Um, I try to be the same, authentic, as genuine as I can possibly be. I don't get on the podium and suddenly I'm a William Ravelli and, and then I'm off and I'm Tim Lottenheiser, the world's nicest person. <laughs> that doesn't work for anyone. So I try to find who I am just as a person and a musician, and that's who I am on the podium. It ties back to the trust factor. So I would avoid you know, trying to be two very different people. Do you tell your students you're going to run this section without stopping, okay, we're going to run this, and did you stop before the end? I do that. I apologize. I say, I'm, I'm sorry, I just lied to you. How many of you said, one more time, oh my gosh, one more time. I think this is probably a common, if we call it a common fault or a trait, but we need to, to think about being as honest as we can, and that, that is fairly harmless. One more time, it's not really honest if we, we do it eight more times, or we're gonna run this, and I've tried to be better about this myself, and just say, if um, one more time, this time with feeling, isn't that the same? Um, this one more time, but with feeling. Um, or to say, we're gonna run this, we're gonna run it. So that's deflating. Okay, we're taking the back half of the piece, we're not stopping. You go and you get halfway, you can't let something go and you stop and you see the students. They're just dejected. So just trying to be honest and follow through with what we, we say. What's your rehearsal demeanor? Are you usually over the top, energetic throughout the rehearsal, or are you typically flat line, calm? I think we as conductors need a contour. I think we need moments where we have somewhat reserved energy, then points of high energy, we come off of that, maybe another spike, but I think we 